Good morning, everybody. It's a little bit early to start, but I, we have about three and a half hours of material to get through in the next hour and a half. So I think I'm going to start with some announcements. Uh, to add to what Zoe has put on the board there about volunteering, on March 6th at here at the Jesuit School of Theology, I'll be giving a half hour talk on uh, spirituality and nonviolence. And I'd like to invite those of you who have been interested in volunteering for META because what we're trying to do is start a speakers bureau. So I'd like, since this is right here, people to come and hear me making a fool of myself in public <laughs> instead of on the university campus and <coughs> see if that's something that you'd be interested in gradually taking a role in. Um, as it is February 13th, I would like to uh, point out that uh, there was a very nonviolent thing that's being done with regard to a recent vote uh, in Congress. I think, no, not a vote in Congress, I guess it was a budget appropriation by the President, which was to cut off all funding for NPR and PBS, which is something that this President does regularly. And in response to that, there was a Valentine's Day ad that was taken out by one media group, which took the attitude of inviting Mr. Taylor, the head of the FCC who had made this disastrous decision or carried it out on the part of his disastrous employers, that uh, they wanted him back. He said, come home, everything is forgiven. And it's just rejoin the love, you know, we are your people. And it struck me that if they could keep up <coughs> with that loving attitude to him when the, as the conflict escalates and they have to get tougher, if they can keep that attitude of love and invitation to him as a person while putting the screws on what he's doing, uh, that would be how nonviolence does it. <coughs> I'm going to be hopping rapidly from one thing to the next for the next few minutes, so fasten your seatbelts. Uh, there's a website called Great Turning Times. It's uh, based on this concept of the Great Turning, which is a phrase coined by uh, Joanna Macy, a well-known American Buddhist teacher, to talk about the big paradigm shift that we're trying to bring about. I think that we're almost there with that term. It's pretty good. I'd like to see something more like a Great Awakening or something like that. But Anyway, in Great Turning Times this week or whatever, however often they refresh, there was a three-part categorization of what has to happen, and which I think is very handy and basically true. We need campaigns and acts of protest to counter the destruction. You know, we need – this is what we are basically talking about here. Two, we need to be building positive alternatives and sustainable ways of living which we've been constantly talking around, calling it constructive program. And three, the part that we're going to get to later in the semester, we need a deep shift in values, thinking, and culture to support all this. And that's going to show up as some of the tips on the Meta Center <coughs> website. Okay. Now what I'd like to do – by the way, what we're going to do today is, after I'm finished with these wrap-ups, we're going to uh, – see a film on the Otpor Rebellion in Serbia. And uh, what I hope will happen is that film will end right at the end of our class. So we, you'll be taking notes as you've done before and we can discuss it on Thursday. But right now I want to go back, believe it or not, into the Philippine chapter of Zunas, Kurtz and Asher. So again, if you don't have your book with you – and I can see why you wouldn't – had to have a special class in taking care of your back in the meditation <laughs> class this morning because so many people are walking around with inordinately heavy backpacks. They've got laptops, lattes, everything in there. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not saying you should bring your book with you. So if you didn't, on pages 131 and following, there's a four-part breakdown of the stages of a, a nonviolent insurrection. We've got several of these things going on. We've got four-part ones, three-part ones, five-part ones. They're all good. They all have some truth to them. Uh, I look forward to the day when we can all come out on the same page and have a manifesto that says this is how it is. But this is one good scheme that they use there, cultural preparation. 
very helpful to do that first rather than discover you should have done it later. Organizational building, propaganda of the deed. Sorry, this is five part actually. Propaganda of the deed, massive non-cooperation, and finally parallel institutions. This I think is where I came up with the theory, the slogan that step five should be step one. That you should be building parallel institutions from the very beginning for the, all the reasons we discussed. Another thing about the Philippine movement that – this will be found on the bottom of page 139. Uh, as you know, one of the bigger problems that we face in building this culture, bringing about this paradigm shift is the language. Uh, the term nonviolence is quite frankly a drag. I don't know if you use that expression anymore. It was, it was pretty hot when I was hanging out with jazz musicians half a century ago. But whatever you, <laughs> whatever you say these days, nonviolence is not exactly inspiring. And it's, it's confusing because in reality, violence is the negation of whatever it is that we're calling nonviolence and not the other way around uh, you know, on some <coughs> ontological level. So the term is terrible. And one does tend to look around the world to see what else people have come up with. And for a while I thought the best alternative was a German expression because they started off saying Gewaltlosigkeit, which was not so great. And that's what you use in Dutch, I think. Gewaltlosigkeit. I think that's what I've heard. I may have pronounced it kind of crudely, but <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Um, anyway, Gewaltlosigkeit means absence of power. So I think it would be very difficult to find a word more confusing than nonviolence, but they found it. But they changed it. They changed it to Gewaltfreiheit, which uh, became current in the 80s. And that means freedom from Gewalt, which means either power or violence, actually. It's a negative kind of power, Gewalt. That's why I say Ach Gewalt. <laughs> but the best term of all is, was brought up in the Philippines and it unfortunately didn't stick. But I like to give it its due, and that is ale dangal, and it means to offer dignity. At last, a positive term for the most positive thing in the universe. To, uh, and an emphasis on dignity, which is a lot less confusing than the emphasis on love, given what most people think love is after they've seen 3,000 commercial messages a day. <laughs> So a lay dangal to offer dignity is probably – it's certainly as I've come across looking around Asia, Europe, wherever I could come across terms for nonviolence. It's the absolute best. Um, there is this very delicate job that you're trying to do if you're a nonviolent actor and you're in a situation where somebody's doing something wrong and you think it's the other guy and you have this very delicate job of awakening his or her conscience without plunging him or her into guilt. Because – and we're going to be giving an example of that. Amy is going to help us out with something in about ten minutes. Uh, because if you, uh, if you spark guilt in someone, what are they going to do? I'll just put that out to you. If you make me feel guilty about something that I've done, what will I probably very typically do, an ordinary person? I'll deny it. I will make a counter accusation. I'll try and put all the emphasis on you. I'll do everything I can to squirm out of that feeling of guilt, which is very intolerable feeling for human beings. People have been – yeah. It perpetuates it because I am now – Matthias is exactly correct. I'm going to have to prove that what I was doing was actually right. I'm going to prove it by doing it more. <laughs> that's, uh, that's how you get to be present. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I almost, almost made a political comment. We don't want to have that here. But yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, here's an example. Uh, when I was a student in Germany, that's where I picked up my fabulous accent. <laughs> no comments. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was having a discussion with some of my fellow students and they were talking about 
the Hitler uh, dictatorship and that era, and they said, well, one thing you have to admire is after everything collapsed around Stalingrad, it would be what, the winter of 1944 or something like that, very – maybe earlier. Uh, when everything collapsed and the whole Sixth Army was wiped out and the Germans were in full retreat, he said, you have to admire them for standing their ground and sticking it out and you know, not giving up. And I said, yeah, there is a kind of courage there which one must admire, but at the same time, the minute they turned around and admitted defeat, they would have admitted that the whole purpose for their program was invalid. And there would have been kind of an emotional collapse. There would have been these terrible feelings of guilt. And you'll do anything to not have those feelings cave in on you. So what we do in nonviolence is we try to separate the awareness of harming from feelings of guilt. Just as we were talking last time about having anger escalating to rage instead of escalating to hatred, the difference being you don't take it personally. Similarly, in nonviolence, you try to get the person to see that his or her behavior was wrong not that his or her behavior characterizes him or her. So you never say what Ronald Reagan said to uh, Jimmy Carter when they were having that uh, disastrous electoral debate. Every time Carter said something that Reagan felt he could trounce on, he said, there you go again. In other words, this is you. Your, your harming, your evil, your bad action is you. I think we would have to disqualify Ronald Reagan from being a nonviolent activist for that very remark. So allay Dangal to offer somebody dignity. The more you offer them dignity, the more you can resist their bad behavior. So it was a terrific uh, concept. They try to terrify you. You refuse to be terrified. Even in that, you're saying, you know, by affirming your own human dignity, you're resonating with theirs. Uh, on page 134, there'll be a couple of interesting things to note. I'm going to have to be really quick on this one. The top paragraph talks about appropriate technology, which was their version of attempting to build in some kind of constructive program. So the movement could go on if there had been more of this. might have had a very different outcome. And also at the bottom paragraph, they talk about a particular type of strike called a Welgangbayan. There are 2,000 languages in the world and I don't know all of them, so I can't tell you what this actually means. But they talk about this as test runs for the kind of general strike that would eventually bring down the government. And that's the great advantage of a sustained campaign. Remember from 164A, we talked about the Bardoli Satyagraha of 1928 as the test run on many different levels for the climactic Salt Satyagraha of 1930. Gandhi found that uh, some of his followers could be leaders in the movement. He found the peasants were ready to stand up and organize themselves and, and act completely nonviolently on, and that it would work. So on many different levels, that was a test run. Yeah. Community working together. Terrific. Thank you very much. Yeah. With a little luck, we'll have a native speaker for every language that we come across here. And alay means to offer and dangal is dignity. Okay. Next time you're writing home, would you tell them to bring that term back? We, we need it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, we, on page 148, we may be having – a start of an answer to – I have a funny feeling I've got the wrong page number here. Um, yeah, it was 145. 145 may be an answer to one of the questions we raised last time or a time before, which was, how are you going to prevent disruptive elements like the Black Bloc up in Oregon? who don't buy into your nonviolent scheme, how are you going to prevent them f 
from coming along with your actions and completely changing their character, right? Because there's no law that says the person that organized the demonstration gets to control what goes on there. Uh, so here's one example. Um, the people who were experienced in strikes were thousand – thousands took to the streets to set up barricades and demonstrate, called on their followers to take to the streets on February 26th. Uh, this must be 1986. We're getting close to the end. By contrast, Aquino encouraged her supporters to stay at home or in churches during the strike. Aquino's insistence that people avoid such public protest must have come both from a concern over a possible outbreak of violence discrediting the movement as well as the fear that leftist elements might seize the leadership of their resistance campaign. So there are times when you have to call a stop and simply not be there so that what you're trying to do is not confused with what other people are doing. <coughs> Finally, one last pair of observations on page 151. And Ramos, uh, the general whom they were defending, acknowledged that we have been successful not so much because of our military option but because of people's power. And as I think this comment of his is the phrase – is where the phrase people's power came from. However, at the bottom of the next paragraph, you have a comment by a very important religious figure in the uprising is Cardinal Jaime Sin. This is – that this guy got to be a cardinal with a last name like that <laughs> really says something <laughs> about the under maturity of the Philippine people. Anyway, he said about – the hundreds of thousands, possibly eventually two million people who sho showed up at the conclusion, the nonviolent moment, which was the EDSA rebellion. It was amazing, he said. I thought we invented that word, but apparently it was around in the 80s. It was amazing. And he goes on to say, it was two million independent decisions. Each one said in his heart, I will do this. And they went out. Okay? So now, for $64,000, why am I so enthusiastic about this comment? Especially on a page when you've just been finished talking about people power. Yeah, it's Catherine. This is person power. Yeah. And it shows you even people power – well, hmm. I was going to say that people power is always a sum of person power, but there are senses in which that can go wrong too because you've been reading in this book about the effervescence of the crowd where there's a crowd phenomenon where kind of super excitation happens uh, and it really just does not do a whole lot of good. But uh, person power will multiply out into people power on occasions when you need it. And it is absolutely the basis. Without each person saying, I'm going to do this and making their individual commitment, it's just a mob being swept along. All right. One last thing then before we start the film. We have just barely enough time to do this. Uh, every year the Pope gives a speech in Rome called Urbi et Orbi, which means for the city and for the world. And we're having a little event here called Arbi et Amy. <laughs> One bad joke per lecture I <laughs> think is probably what we have to put up with. Uh, I hope you got the point of what Arby was sharing with us last time. There's an event that's been taking place on campus traditionally which has been a commemoration of the Armenian Genocide which of course deserves and needs it. But in conversations with me, he and I worked out this scheme of trying to morph it a little bit from just a commemoration by the one community to a reconciliation of the two communities. And that, that's what we've been working on and that's what led to his having this very interesting struggle that he has to have – it's the great chain of nonviolence all over again. You have to start with the executive committee of the Armenian community, then the Armenian community at large, and then the Turkish community. So what I'd like Amy to tell us about is something that happened uh, last week. Come on up, Amy. 
uh, whereas you know we had a presentation by a group uh, which is trying to stop. Just hope I don't have to disrobe this. So here we go. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. You just finish talking. Okay. Um, so last Wednesday evening there was a presentation by a group called The World Can't Wait, which I don't know if any of you know very much about them, but they are very revolutionary um, and they're very controversial. And I was kind of hesitant as to whether I wanted to even go to this or not because I thought that they would just be kind of preaching about the need for you know, a worker uprising and kind of a Maoist sort of revolution. But I went because there was also an Iraq war veteran that was speaking there. And um, his name was Liam Madden. And his message was actually very useful, I think, for nonviolent activism. And um, it was a lot more mainstream than the revolutionaries. Um, but he has started something called the Appeal for Redress. Um, that's a way to prove through mm. military law that the war in Iraq is illegal. And he's gotten um, 1,300 people to sign on to this. Um, so it could possibly go somewhere and make a difference. Um, and he had some interesting messages um, that I thought kind of corresponded with some ideas in nonviolence. And one of them was um, the idea of um, work versus work. Um, he talked about, um, you know, we need to protest against this war. Um, and the idea that one protest may not make a big difference, but if we can develop a culture of protest, then that will make all the difference. Um, so the need for persistence and um, yeah, dedication to social change. And he also talked a lot about the need for students to get involved, and it tied in a lot with the idea of person power. Um, he, he talked about the need to dispel this fear in students that I'm not a leader, you know, what do I have to contribute, what makes me so special? Um, and to quote him directly, he said, we live in a time that desperately needs leaders, and if you don't consider yourself a leader, then you'd better make yourself one. And I thought that was really powerful to me because I always have reservations about getting up and leading things. You're doing fine. <laughs> um, and lastly, um, he kind of touched on, actually the whole organization kind of touched on the law of progression a little bit because um, they talked about American society as a spectrum with the people who really care about social change, who really like protest the war in Iraq, they think it's an illegal war, um, they protest the idea of torture, all of that, and they want to do something active about it, um, and people who are happy with the status quo. Um, but in the middle, there's this huge gap and he said, most of us are in this like shades of gray kind of zone. Um, but when the people who really care start to act, then more and more people will drift over to that side of the spectrum. If we can convince them through, I think, nonviolence that um, these are issues we should take action about, then um, eventually more people will get involved. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Amy, not <laughs> a contribution to this class has been invaluable this morning. She brought my latte and now this. And I'm going to have more to say about the conversation that she had with these people, but I think it actually would fit better after the film. So this is one of these films by uh, Ackerman and Duval, and it's about we are now actually becoming, we're coming into the 21st century in this course. So this is 164B real time. This is 2000 uh, January, and I think the film kind of speaks for itself. So, John, 